All right, hello everyone. This is Nick Joyce up here in Montreal for Valhalla Movement, sitting down with Diana Leaf Christian and my co-host. Mark Pola, as, uh, as usual, you've seen me on this podcast before. It won't be the first time and the last time you see me here. Um, and yeah, super excited, super exciting guest, which uh, let me let Nick run you through her credentials. Absolutely. Diana Leaf Christian has been someone that I personally have been looking into for quite some time. She authored two books that are kind of uh, some of the best blueprints we have right now looking at, first of all, one of them is called Creating a Life Together, which is about essentially how to start a community, and another one that came out a little later called Finding Community, which is essentially about finding a community to join and how to move through that process in an effective fashion. She is an expert on the social dimension as well as a person who really lives their own values and is a resident of the Earth Haven Eco Village in North Carolina. So how are you doing, Diana? I'm doing fine. Hello. <laughs> I mean, in, in so many circles, um, ever since the Valhalla movement started and all this this talk about community and sustainable living has kind of entered into my life, I've heard your name resonate time and time again with so many people. It's, it's unbelievable how many people have mentioned your book, um, both your books really, and, and all the information that you've kind of written about and studied on uh, starting a community, uh, what are the aspects that go into it, what consensus means, and, and how there's a, a cloud of, of uh, there's, there's kind of like a misperception of what that really means and how that really works. Um, so, I mean, great to have you here. Great to have you on the podcast. Great. Wonderful. I'm glad to be here. What shall we talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Never a challenge when talking to somebody of your stature. Um, okay, so first of all, let's, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about where you live now. I mean, you know, there's so many few people that, there's a lot of people that talk about sustainable living, but it seems like you're embodying it. And, and I'd love to hear more about where you're coming from, where you were actually um, at, you know, where, where are you actually situated and what is your, your current living situation? Sure. I live in a um, off-grid home site, um, sharing a house with my mom. It's a quarter-acre home site in the Forest Garden neighborhood, one of 13 neighborhoods in Earth Haven Eco Village, which is in the mountains of southern Appalachia in western North Carolina. Earth Haven is a 19-year-old community, um, and we're all off the grid. We live in passive solar homes, many of which we built ourselves or that our fellow community members built. Uh, we try to have a lot of insulation and thermal mass and backup wood stove heating. We generally do roof water catchment. We have composting toilets. Our water sources are some wells, as I said, roof water catchment and also um, uh, springs that we tap. Um, we have construction, constructed wetlands here and there, gray water, recycling, and lots and lots of things that you would think of in terms of physical sustainability. We also have what you might call social sustainability in the sense that we are our own government. Mm -hmm. We members here decide our own what you might call zoning regulations for <laughs> ourselves, and we decide how to manage ourselves as a village through um, um, a group of people, all, all of us are invited and only some actually do this, but it's um, bi-monthly business meetings. And we have many, many committees, finance committee, membership committee, promotions committee, repair and maintenance committee, small projects, land use, site planning, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, like most intentional communities do. And, and uh, what else we have is uh, what we hope to create as a village scale economy, which you might call economic sustainability. Rural communities need to figure out, okay, how do we make a living here? How do our members make a living? Can we have jobs on site that are created by members who create small businesses, cottage industries that are ecologically sustainable so that that person can earn some money and they can hire fellow community members? So we encourage that as much as we can. Over the years, we have had different businesses here that members have started. Unlike income sharing communities, we don't have a community owned business or two or three mm -hmm. like Twin Oaks does, which is an income sharing community. We're an independent income community, so everybody earns their own living their own way. And various members have started their own small businesses. Um, 
but they're not all the same ones now that they were years ago because businesses come and go as things change here. So now we have about four or five businesses on site. We have people who make a living through telecommuting, people who make a living by working for others on site, people who make a living by their own little business on site, or people who go off site to work, which is not very many people, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. We have people who are retired, thus their living is already set up. And so we're learning and teaching ecological, social, and economic sustainability. We're learning it and we're also teaching it. So we're kind of learning and teaching as we go along. So does your experience um, come from mainly living in this, this community which you're inhabiting now? Or, or what's your prior experience? Like what turned you on to communities when you were younger and, 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 and kind of what led you in this direction? And then what are some of your, your maybe your previous experiences leading up to this? I've been involved in this for 22 years. I started in 1991 um, by doing a newsletter about how you start new communities. It was hmm. journalism as forcing function. I didn't know a thing. So I would, <laughs> I would schedule my, you, you're journalists, you understand this. I would, I would schedule myself to write articles about something and then I would learn about it and then I would publish it. <laughs> it was a little bit uh, high pressure. You know? And I really had a fast education. And after a year of producing this newsletter with my friend Daniel, um, then uh, Communities Magazine hired me to be their part-time editor. And I folded the newsletter into the magazine. And after a while, I learned a whole lot more about communities just by virtue of reading all the articles that came across my desk, those that we published and that I edited, those that we did not. I read them all. Mm -hmm. And then the Fellowship for Intentional Community, which I worked for, which is the publisher of the magazine, uh, they would uh, have board meetings in different communities around the country, and I would go to those board meetings so that I could learn what my bosses wanted me to do as the magazine editor. And I would interview people in that community. And I was interviewing people everywhere. And I'd say things like, okay, how did you start this community? What worked well? What would you advise other people starting a community to always do? Mm -hmm. What didn't work well? What would you advise people starting a community to never do because it didn't work well? When I mean, you had big challenges, how did you resolve them? What did you do? And I was sort of like this fierce, relentless reporter person who would grab a hold of the community founders and I really wouldn't let them go until they told me everything I wanted to know. And so I basically was like a, a learning sponge traveling reporter person, you know, wanting to find out, okay, what is this mysterious thing called how do you start a community? I was acutely aware that there was nothing written down anywhere about how you do it. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit in one book here and another little bit in another book there, but there was no basic guidebook. Okay, how do you do this? And I, I would hear these big giant messages inside my head from the universe, if you will, that would go, write a book about this. And I'd say, <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> and then the universe would say in its big booming voice, so then learn how. So being a magazine editor was good um, training for me to learn how to write a book. So I was writing magazine articles for mm -hmm. years already. So I just wrote a series of articles called Chapters and wrote the book. And <laughs> it was a Canadian publisher, New Society publisher, who published it. And um, it was the first book. And as far as I know, so far, the only one that says, okay, here's step by step is what I have learned from founders that does work and doesn't work. What to do, what not to do, how not to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've become a consultant and a workshop leader teaching forming community groups. Okay, here's what seems to work well. And working with existing communities who might be going crazy from conflict or different issues, saying to me, come on over here and be a workshop consultant for us. What can you help us do? What can you help us do? Well, that shifted from doing it only in the U.S. to doing it in the U.S. and Canada to then doing it internationally. And now I've been on multiple different continents and countries. And to my astonishment, the same kind of issues come up in communities in different cultures, on different mm -hmm. continents. You would think there'd be different issues, wouldn't you? But it seems that human beings, when they get together in groups to do this thing called community, have the same kinds of problems, 
and the same kinds of solutions. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm a little bit like, well, there's this American folk character called Johnny Appleseed, which you would have known about, I think, Nick. A oh, guy we've in all the heard of him. Yeah. You have okay. He would <laughs> traveled around the U.S. in the 1800s, collecting apple seeds everywhere he goes, and then he gets to the next location and he shares the apple seeds. Mm -hmm. Thus, he's promulgating different varieties of apples all over the at the time U.S however big it was in the 1800s. So I'm sort of like the Johnny Appleseed traveling community seed gatherer planter person because <laughs> what I learned that works really well in this community then I can share with this community and then I'm learning more and so I'm just gathering seeds everywhere I go and now the UK and Europe and Asia and Latin America and, and Israel I've been to a lot of places by now and um, what do you think? <laughs> Same kinds of issues come up so I'm pretty much convinced of something that I never would have guessed, which is that human beings in groups and community pretty much behave the same ways, have the same kinds of challenges, the same kinds of resolutions tend to help those challenges. So I am the self-appointed person. Who appointed me? Well, I appointed me to go find this stuff out and pass these apple seeds around, you know? That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's... It's such a much needed task for someone to take on and to have, you know, essentially when I when I first walked into Valhalla, I, I found a team of young people who are really inspired to create a blueprint on how to create a community. And while there's definitely elements that I think, um, you know, different different generations can communicate with each other more effectively. I think that to have someone that has been out there and doing it for, you know, since we were born is such a tremendous gift um, and that's really a huge so right. that's really a huge part of, of why we are so excited to have you on this call you know if we start the process that you started 22 years ago it's gonna take us another 22 years to get to where you are right now maybe a little bit shorter with with the internet and all that you know some <laughs> right. global communication going on but um we we are here to pick your brain Diana and hear okay hear some of those insights that you've had um, maybe we're obviously going to put a link to the book and encourage as many people as possible to spend some time reading it if this is something you're thinking about this is an excellently structured book that goes through all kinds of different pieces of it you know from finding the initial members to to finding the land to figuring out the zoning to figuring out the system of governance i mean it's really just a whole gamut of information so maybe to either extract out some really key points for you from that book, but then also if there's anything that you've been running into since the publication of that book, because that was there quite is. some time yeah. ago now that, that you would really like to share with us. Yeah, like, I mean, one of the first questions that I would have is like, and a lot of people ask us this, is, you know, here at Valhalla, we've had the opportunity of having a big piece of land that we started off with to begin with. You know, mm -hmm. our community is kind of kicking off and we have 60 acres of land. Which is, which is great, that's huge, but mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have that same opportunity. They do have the intention, though, of getting this, this piece of land and, and turning and building out these communities. Um, mm -hmm. In your mind, is it essential to have the land first? Like, what comes first? What's step one in building a community, uh, according to you? Well, I'm going to answer that in two apparently opposite ways. I hope <laughs> you'll forgive me. Oh, go for what, it. One way to answer it is... Um, you don't need the land first. What you need is a group of people with a shared vision, mission, and aim. So here's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. Shared vision is how we want the world to be a better place in the future. Mm -hmm. Shared mission is the big picture of what we're going to do as a group to help create that world. Mm -hmm. But not details, big picture. Mm -hmm. And aim is details, what we're going to do to create that world. The physical things we'll do and the non-physical things we'll do. Mm -hmm. And and do you so, think that we should break down into... The vision. The mission and the aim is the what we're doing. Mm -hmm. The mission is the big picture. The aim is the details. Okay. I would... Um, we're, we're actually in a process right now. I want to interject real quick and ask you, what is, what is your vision? Because I think that's one of the, the hardest things to answer without sounding very ambiguous I guess you know you, I, for us it's like you can throw out a word like I want to see a more sustainable and connected world but but what does a vision sound like for you 
Okay, why don't I tell you my personal vision, mission, and aim to kind of give an example. Great, great. Um, but because you can do this for your own self, not just for a community. But Absolutely. then I want to tell you the other opposite thing that I was about to say so we don't lose it, okay? Yeah, definitely. All right, my personal vision is for a world where people feel happy and safe and aren't under the threat of starvation, not having enough food or being too cold or too hot, and they're not under the threat of being killed or maimed or hurt or crippled in a war or by some some people that would hurt them. That is to say, safety for humans. Now, you might think, but that's not like human beings. We can't be like that. Oh, it's okay. I still have that vision. And I would want that um, we live more ecologically sustainable, more socially sustainable, with small localized self-governance run in a democratic and fair participatory way among the people who are governing themselves and economically sustainable, meaning we have a localization kind of cottage industries locally. In other words, just look at what transition town people say they want for the future. Well, that would be what I want too. <laughs> locally resilient, ecologically, socially, economically sustainable mm -hmm. folks. Okay, that's my vision for the future. Boy, is it ever altruistic. That's okay. I give myself permission to envision a future like that. We might have to go to the Star Trek future before we ever get to that one, but that's okay. Okay, mission. What am I here to do? I'm here to find out how I can help with the process relative to intentional communities of all kinds. That's kind of the big picture. What am I doing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the details of the aim. The physical things I do. Is a website physical or non-physical? I'm going to call it physical. It's I'm going to call it kind of like a physical manifestation. Okay. Of it. Okay. My new website, which will be coming online soon to replace the currently out of date one, will have every single resource that I have access to online and downloadable. Everything in English, everything I have in French, everything I have in Spanish, everything I have in Hebrew, everything I have in Russian, everything I have in German. Hmm. And that will be downloadable in to the degree that I have resources in those languages, which I do. It'll, it'll be a place that people can go and click and get information. It'll have all kinds of videos of me doing instruction on various kinds of things, so you don't actually have to hire me. You can just watch videos. Wow. These videos will be on YouTube, too, I think, if I can manage, and also on my website. So my website, that isn't here yet, but soon will be, um, is going to be a source to get a lot of information. Because if I got picked up by aliens or hit by a truck next week, I'd want everything I know to be still available to folks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's one thing. And then the another physical thing, is this physical? My personal self, I guess that's physical. Uh, teaching workshops, being a speaker at conferences, giving slideshows and bookstores and all the stuff that I already do non-physical things, the information, which is, you know, what you can get off the website and download. I'm trying to provide encouraging, empowering, informative, and accurate, helpful information about how to do this thing called start communities, thrive in communities, deal with issues and conflicts that come up in a way that is healthy and sustainable. I'm particularly interested in governance and a piece of governance, which is decision-making. Mm -hmm. Governance is bigger than decision-making. Decision making is a piece. Governance is what do we decide about and decision making is how do we decide. Mm -hmm. So governance is the big thing I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I have taught consensus for a long time and I have done consensus in various organizations for a long time and I'm a facilitator of it and I teach it. But I don't recommend it anymore. I recommend sociocracy yeah. or holacracy. But hmm. for communities, I recommend sociocracy because it's cheaper to learn and holacracy is expensive to learn. Thus, I recommend sociocracy and now I'm a sociocracy trainer. Wow. So this is yeah. a very big shift. I mean, a lot of things, I think the synonymous with community is tons of people think, oh, well, okay, you have to have consensus for everything and everyone has to agree on everything. And that's a very, very mis big misconception, I think. So it's interesting to see that you made a shift to, to sociocracy and stuff. Um, well, I, I'm with you, Mark. Um, I agree that it's not necessarily turns out that way. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just say a little bit about this. Then I'd like to go back to the other side of the opposite yeah, thing. Yeah, we, we do want to go further down into this, but before that we pro probably want okay. to go into the other side. Yeah, I wrote a series of articles for Communities Magazine, some of which are online on my newsletter called Eco Villages Newsletter. 
um, called Busting the Myth, Busting the Myth, mm -hmm. that consensus with unanimity is good for communities. Mm -hmm. When many, many communities got started 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 years ago, the only other alternative we had for decision making was majority rule voting. And we didn't want any tyranny of the majority. We yeah. wanted something more fair and more kind and more humane and more compassionate. Mm -hmm. So we all went, consensus, the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, thank you. And we bowed down to it right. because it was like, you know, a holy sacred thing. So then many, 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 many communities used consensus with the idea that we all had to agree before we could pass a proposal and that that would create for us harmony, trust, connection, mm -hmm. And instead, what many wow. communities found out was that it created harmony, trust, and connection when we all agreed. Right. And when we didn't, it created disharmony, disconnection, lack of trust, demoralization, exhaustion, fatigue, disappointment, and people no longer going to meetings. The older the community, that is to say, the longer ago that it got started by countercultural folks who are now in their 60s and 70s, but at the time were youth in the 1960s and 70s, the more rigid consensus would be. <laughs> Meaning, we have to all agree, and if somebody blocks, there's no recourse, there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. We just have to go, oh, okay, you're blocking, thank you. And <laughs> hope that we're gonna have harmony, trust, and connection. Which is basically not true. Mm -hmm. And so somebody had to be the one to go, hello, I think the emperor has no clothes here. Yeah. So I appointed me to be that person, or at least one of them, Mm -hmm. And so I started writing this article series and trying to stir the pot. Well, at the same time, many, 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 many intentional communities across North America and in Europe are going, I don't think I believe this myth. Not because of me. They were already doing this. Mm -hmm. And they said, let's make a modification that allows somebody to block and then we have some steps we can take. Is the block legitimate? Is it valid? Is it principled? Is it based in our mission and purpose? Mm -hmm. Does the proposal actually harm the community or is this that person's personal lifestyle choice? In which case it's not an allowable block. Or is this that person's personal values or personal interpretation of what we're doing here? And if so, we're not allowing that block. Or we have a series of solution-oriented meetings where the blocking person or persons and those who advocate the proposal get together in order to create a new proposal that addresses the same issues. But if they don't, we bring the original proposal back for something like a 75% supermajority vote, mm -hmm. which all, all of that is designed to reduce the ability of one person to control the whole group, which is what in classic consensus with unanimity and no recourse if someone blocks is the truth. You know, any one person can control the whole group. And so many, many communities are shifting away from that. And I'm glad because I want communities to have more people be more happy more of the time. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote the article series. Um, so why I got interested in sociocracy is because I think that its decision-making method, which is called consent decision-making, functions better than consensus, even when consensus has these beneficial modifications. And I like the fact that it's a whole systems governance process that helps an organization have the whole governance piece that's beautifully designed to function well and help make more happiness and well-being and harmony in the group, which it does when practiced correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's my little quick wrap on consensus and sociocracy. Yeah, I mean, we, it's, we ought to definitely go back into <laughs> into what sociocracy means because, I mean, you're introducing a word that most people have never heard of right now. And, and even myself, I, you know, we've talked about it here and, and kind of, I think Nick really brought it to the table for the group here at Valhalla. Um, but the definition of such and, and, and what it entails and how that system of governance works is something we're still really figuring out. I mean, we're a year into this kind of process um, and it's not necessarily all set in stone and clear. We do have some guidelines that we've come up with um, and that we've kind of working. Well, have you, been, have you been trained in it by a sociocracy trainer? No, that's but that's mean. exactly why we're talking to you. <laughs> that's why like that's why a... yeah that's why you're coming to montreal that's why we want to learn part of this from you is, is sure. and, and in visiting other communities and stuff as well i mean we're trying to take from a whole pool of knowledge that um 
that you have accumulated and that other people have accumulated. And we realize, I think, that is the first thing that is the first step in admitting there's a problem is is realizing and admitting it, right? Like the first the first solution is is kind of understanding. Okay, we can't do this forever. You know, right now we're a small group and we kind of we kind of are operating on a consensus basis. There's definitely decisions that are made where some people disagree and others agree more. Have you been trained in how to do consensus properly by a consensus trainer? Um, yeah, we've had more more um, kind of facilitation and more help on the consensus side of things. But at the end of the day, I think most people truthfully are already have come to the understanding that we don't agree with consensus. I, I personally don't, I mean, just to start off with, I don't fully agree that consensus is the way to go. I think that there has to be a better system than consensus and and then and, and i know that it has a misconception and i know that the idea the main idea behind a kind consensus base is that everyone agrees i understand that in practice there are ways that you can kind of break that down a little bit and come come out to something that that doesn't fully mean that but it's still that's still the goal right the goal is that everyone agrees and i don't i just i i disagree that everyone's going to agree well it depends see if if your group meets the criteria for using consensus in the first place mm -hmm. and there is criteria and one of them is that you're exactly on the same page for mission vision and aim exactly and a lot of groups are not because they didn't know that because they didn't know because they didn't know it's not yeah. their fault they just didn't know Absolutely. so if you have people who want different things sitting in that circle well you're not qualified to even use consensus but here's another here's another criteria you have to all get trained in it so you're on the same page for what system you're using mm -hmm. because consensus can be like this it can be like that it can be like that it can be like that what system are you using are you in agreement mm -hmm. if you don't even know if you are or not this is a, a setup for structural conflict absolutely okay? so that's the second thing the third is are you a small cohesive group mm -hmm. well maybe you're a small group or maybe you're a large group if you might be cohesive or not cohesive ah another mm -hmm. thing is are you willing to spend a whole lot of meeting process time processing and processing, processing and processing your emotions and your emotions and you're upset and you're just, you have that strategy and you have that and you're upset there and you're, and it's taking hours and hours and hours and hours to process and why? Well, because we're using consensus. Wait a minute. What if we don't want to use hours and hours of process time? What if we want to have a system that just works better at the start? Here's another criteria. You need a very well-trained facilitator. This mm -hmm. facilitator has to have the, the skills of Gandhi and Mother Teresa. And, I fully agree. And Einstein. First of all, the facilitator has to be brilliant with the left brain scanning for are we in agreement? May I summarize where we are right now? Let me do a contact statement. Mm -hmm. Am I keeping to the agenda contract? How far are we in the discussion? How much more minutes do we have? This is like a left brain genius thing. While the Mother Teresa Gandhi part is scanning for vibes with the heart, you know. How is this person feeling? How is that person feeling? Whereas in sociocracy, all you have to do is understand the system and then step by step do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a genius or Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. You just can be a regular normal person like me or you. Absolutely. I, so I, that's... I think, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we, you know, just to, uh, to give insight to, to what Valhalla has done and to give insight to how I think um, the process of, of creating this mission statement and all these things is, and, and I learned this in business school, is that your business plan, you never start stop writing your business plan. Yes, and the right. same applies not only to a business plan, but to a community. You never stop writing your mission statement. You never stop adjusting it, re revisiting it, re reconstruing it, feeling mm -hmm. out where the, I think the vision statement is always the same. The You're talking statement, about strategy. You yeah. always are adjusting strategy to meet real life circumstances, right? Yeah, but even even I think the mission statement itself sometimes changes. You know, like one of the things that we had at the beginning was really focused on okay, we're we're creating a sustainable community, and the first thing we're doing is making a a, a community center where this community can run and, and and be facilitated out of, where we can have events, where we can store our tools, where we can do all the physical and non physical things that that, that make up a community, uh -huh. where we can have all these social gatherings and stuff. But over time, it's kind of moved. It's kind of it transforms. We we now you know one of our strengths here is 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 marketing. For example, we call them outreach, which is that we're really good at making websites and making videos and and, and spreading the word and being kind of the megaphone um, to this. You know, this is why we're doing podcasts and stuff. 
Uh What we're less good at is this, you know, facilitating um, conversations, consensus based uh, decision making, creating a system of government and also some of the, the, you know, the trade, you know, we're not all solar panel installers either. You know, we're we're at the point where you were in 1991, where we knew nothing about anything, um, but knew that it had to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of we had this we had the collective vision that that's definitely there. Our strategy, our aim and our and in, in, in my in understanding of it, our in, input to our mission has kind of shifted slowly and morphed and changed over time. And I always equate this back to my business school kind of training, which was your business plan, your aim, your strategy, and to some degree your mission has to be a self-sustainable thing as, as a whole. It's a living organism in, in itself. It's, a, it's an ever-changing, ever-growing, ever-wiser process. And, and I know, I'm sure I'm, I'm evoking tons of emotion and, and ideas and, and things and, and <laughs> interest in your mind towards that. But, I, but I'm telling you that this, this is how it's, how it's played out so far. In yes, year but- one of Valhalla, this is what it's been. Is this the ideal situation? Should we have a, 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 a very strict mission statement? Should it ever change? This is a question that, you know, I'll leave to you to... to... Okay, well, I do have um, some thoughts about that. Yeah. You probably see me sitting here going, Ooh, and mm. I do, I have thoughts about that. For sure. um, the what you're doing might adjust itself as you sh- as you learn over your first year and more than your first year. But basically, I wouldn't revisit the what very often mm-hmm. because you can cause some members to want to leave if you shift the what to something that they didn't want. Fully agree. And, and so you need to kind of have a baseline of what we're doing that stays the same for a while. Mm-hmm. But let's take some of these words like how. <clears throat> Excuse me. How, when, and where. Oh, I... How, when, and where is strategy stuff. Yeah. What is mission stuff. Mm-hmm. Why is vision stuff. Oh. So why are we doing this? This better world, right? What are we doing? Well, we're creating Valhalla, this intentional community that has these skills and these services and these things that we're doing. We might add to the what from time to time as we learn more. But we're adjusting our strategy all the time because real life circumstances are telling us uh, the how, the when, and the where might shift a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you're willing to be flexible. I'm glad you understand what anybody who's been to business school or who is an owner of a business or an entrepreneur knows, which is that we need to get real life data about how is this thing working in real time in real life Mm -hmm. and then adjust it. Mm-hmm. To, to, to you know to match what we're learning because we're constantly a learning organism but I wouldn't change the what very often mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying I, I I more than know what you're saying okay good. I, just to give you a some perspective <laughs> and I, I know this is a little bit off topic but I, here's a here's a topic that that has been true to me for a while okay. is I actually own a marketing company and this is how the kind of whole community and how the land purchase was made possible Uh Um, was actually through this kind of marketing company and the name of the marketing company is called why simply because okay and I operate under WSB media so that sometimes I get less questions in 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 more business setting but in terms of um, what it really means is that why is the guiding source of where everything comes from you have to start with why and there's a famous TED talk that I'm going to invite people to go and check out by um, Simon Sinek his name is brilliant brilliant ted talk one of the most watched ted talks of all time and um are you writing that down is that yeah simon Cena, you have to you have to watch it you start with what's why. it called what's it called i think it's called start with why okay. if you if you google simon Sinek um ted talk or start with why or why uh ted talk you'll definitely find it it's like okay, the t- one of the top 10 um great. and i'll link it in the description below for other people it's a okay. 20 minute thing i literally I don't. I saw it after I came up with this concept. Okay, this is like a year after I actually had this this kind of revelation to me. But everyone has this. Like the most important thing that an organization has is its why. That's why right. is what brings everyone together. It is the number one way to reach consensus is to boil back down to the why. Because if exactly. you're all, I mean, it's the most important thing that I've ever explained to anyone before you start any project, before you do anything. I always say there's six simple steps of success. If you can answer who, what, where, when, why, and how, you are being, you're going to have a successful project. But if you start with the when and the how and all the what and all those things, without the why, you're bound to fail. You yes. have to start with the why. And I've, oh man, I can't, I can't express how happy I am that you're saying these exact 
words uh, <laughs> back to us, and, and you have years of wisdom on this. But this is exactly how Valhalla started. We all agreed with why, and I'm sure every intentional community out there that's successful and, and still running today has a very, very strong why slash vision statement. Oh, well, can I say something about that? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> there are communities with big time, big time conflict. Mm -hmm. And because I analyze things in terms of distinguishing between structural conflict and interpersonal conflict, I often see what community members think of as interpersonal conflict, you know, like you're behaving like that and I'm behaving like, why are you acting like that? And we all think that we need a conflict resolution person to come and talk to us about our emotions, but really it's in the basement, the foundation of the whole system where the conflict lies. It's structural conflict. Mm -hmm. It's a setup that we're bound to have conflict because we didn't do certain extremely important things at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that can go really haywire with the community or any organization, including businesses and nonprofits, is that we don't have our why set up clearly. That is to say, whatever we say in our documents on our website or our brochure about what we're doing and why we're doing it, mm -hmm. the big picture why, the smaller picture what, it's in vague, airy-fairy, general, idealistic, theoretical language, mm -hmm. which means that it functions very much like a Rorschach inkblot test mm -hmm. upon which anybody reading it can project onto it what they think it means mm -hmm. and of course us being human creatures we're going to project onto it the thing we think it should mean we hope it means we wish it means mm -hmm. so you might get a community with a new agey kind of mission and purpose statement on their website right and along comes a person who thinks this means we must protect the earth from humans including those bad eco-villagers who might want to create homes and farms and gardens by cutting down trees. Hiss, boo, attack them. Mm -hmm. Other people might join that very same community and think, oh, clearly we have to create an agrarian village to demonstrate mm -hmm. to the world that what we're doing is sustainable. A third group of people might read the very same statements on the website or in a brochure and say, oh, clearly we have to have a group of people who sit in a circle and do long hours of processing of emotions so that we can create deep personal connections between all of our hearts because we deeply know each other and we put the time into um, therapeutic emotional healing kinds of meetings. Mm -hmm. We don't care about agrarian village. That's merely the physical world. We don't care about protecting the planet from the bad eco-villagers because what we're really doing is about our hearts. Why do we have these three kinds of people here in the community? Well, because our mission and purpose, vision, mission, aim was vague and idealistic and theoretical and not clear enough. So now we all are in the community. We put our life savings into it and we are using a decision-making method that requires us all to be on the same page. So what are we doing? We're creating proposals and then the other people are stopping those proposals. And why are they stopping them? Well, because it violates the mission and purpose. Whose mission and purpose? Well, the one that I think we are doing. Wait, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. No, we're doing this. No, we're doing that. Come on, you read the statement. Well, the statement is too damn vague. So we would end up with three different kinds of people with three different heartfelt, deeply held, important value-based mm -hmm. interpretations of what the heck we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of a terrible conflict that often happens in communities. Absolutely. And Mark, it's because the why is not clear. I, it's not clear enough. I, I mean, fully, fully, fully agree. The number of times that we've talked about the why and our vision and our mission and, and the reason why we've been adjusting and moving and doing these things at any one time is so that we make sure that everyone is on the same page going forward. And it's, it's a so brutal I want to tell process you about sometimes. The... It's, it's such oh, a, I'm just sorry. out of my experience, and I know Nick has seen it from more of an outside perspective. Um, I mean, how do you feel about it sometimes? We've talked about this so many times. It's such a brutal process. How do you, how do, have you experienced our discussions of why, for example? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's the first question that I asked you is how does one go into a vision that is not ambiguous? And I think um, I think for me, even 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 in what even in what you described as your vision, I hear a lot of 
you know, the, it's a big concept. So it's not nece- for me. It's not necessarily where you really need to break it down. For me at Valhalla, the biggest challenge that we have is our mission. Like, is our priority? You know, now now we've come to a point where we've achieved clarity. But from from the ground up, we have a team of people who are phenomenal at creating media and and documenting the process and you know creating a creating a viral movement around the topics of sustainability and community and of course you know there's this desire to walk your talk so i walked into a household where i saw a very divided team of people who are like okay i'm here in montreal i want to have an earth ship where i raise my two children and people who are like let's make a bunch of videos and make the ideas of sustainability and community something that we can get the mainstream to connect to. And so from the get-go, you know, within a week of being here, this process started of kind of diversifying between what Valhalla Montreal is and what Valhalla as a movement is. So now the identity around both of those entities is becoming a lot clearer. But I wouldn't say that the why is different. The reasons that we want to make sustainability and community mainstream are the same as the reason why that person wants to build their Earthship home for their two daughters. Sure, you have the same why, you just have different what. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you might have different projects, one being an intentional community that's urban, one being some other kinds of activities and projects. That seems completely legit. Hey, I want to slip in something. Mm -hmm. When a group is having frustration or difficulty with consensus, I wouldn't recommend to them that they go shift over to sociocracy because, I mean, I do, but it takes a while. You have to learn it. It's like learning another language. I used to say to people, it's like learning French, but since you both are fluent in French, (laughs) then that doesn't seem so hard, right? It's like learning Russian, (laughs) and and it's learning another language. So it takes a while. So I recommend the in like the letter in, in street consensus method. Mm-hmm. In street co-housing, it's a yeah. group in Davis, California, and they have a method of using consensus that has worked so well for them for 26 years. And it really reduces conflict and increases goodwill because it doesn't allow willy-nilly blocking or too frequent blocking or personal blocking or frivolous blocking. It's a method by which someone who blocks a proposal uh, or several people get together with, uh, with the proponents of the proposal in a series of solution-oriented meetings over a certain period of time to come up with a new proposal together that addresses the original issue. Yeah. And if they do, they bring it to the next meeting, and it's very likely it'll pass because look who created it. Exactly. Exactly. But so if, it's like taking... But wait, hold on. Sure. Well, there's another part. <laughs> if they don't, or they can't, or they can't agree, the first one comes back. For 75% supermajority vote. They've only had to do this twice in their history. Hmm. And they only had two solution oriented meetings each of those times. So that's four meetings in 26 years. This is a fabulous method. Hmm. So I recommend it, and I have a handout about it, which I will make available to your website that can accompany this video if you like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So, yeah, because it's, it's like a interim solution for a group who has studied and understands consensus that they might be interested in sociocracy or holacracy, but they can't spend the time and energy and money to do that yet, so here's a really good interim method. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean... Absolutely. I mean, that's that's actually something that I've been encouraging. I've actually read your article on End Street, but I'd totally forgotten about it and didn't remember those two pieces, but... I've actually, uh, we, we've ended up at the table for lengthy periods of time with one person who has this idea and is kind of what I would call like the major positive, and then you have the major negative, the person who's most resistant to that idea. And while these two people argue, everyone else is is prevented from moving forward. So I've actually come forward a few times and suggested that we take, you know, the most positive person for this proposal and the person who's most opposed to it offline and they go and have a chat and figure out how they can make it happen and then they come back because all the rest of us are sitting there like yeah this sounds fine you know and then there's only one person who's so against it for whatever reason but yeah we've had that successfully work here already i'm glad to hear that I've got a, would you like to hear the other side of the yes oh. <laughs> you know what so let's go to the other side but i've got another question that all right I think um, that will bring into uh, into aspects technology and decision making. And we've, okay. we've proposed something, or I proposed something a while ago, 
and we've kind of been moving in this direction. We still don't have it up yet, but I'd rather hear the other side first, and then I'll, I'll ask you this question. All right. It's, it's okay with me that we're hopping all over the netball, but it's okay with you. Oh, it's fine. All right. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, back to your question about should you get the land first or should you not? Yeah. On the one hand, well, I think the first thing to do is get vision, mission, and aim, and then get a governance system with a fair participatory equivalent decision-making method. Mm-hmm. And have those things in place and have good process and communication skills that you learn and put into place. I highly recommend nonviolent communication as a method for groups to, to learn. Have a good conflict resolution method in place. I highly recommend restorative circles, which is based on nonviolent communication. Mm-hmm. So, so there's these really good tools that I highly recommend for groups, you know. Then create a criteria for the property. The very first thing you need, though, before you even do vision, mission, and aim is, are we urban or rural? Or suburban or semi-rural? Are we connected to and really close to this big urban center? Or are we over there? Because you don't want to spend people's precious time and energy coming up with mission and purpose if you're not even sure you're on the same page for location Mm -hmm. or rural, urban. Mm-hmm. Another really big thing to think about is are you going to be an independent income community or income sharing? Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming you you and your viewers know the difference, but just briefly in case you don't, independent income is like any co-housing community or like my community where people make a living however they do in their own job or through telecommuting or they have their own business or they have some source of money that they get and it's their own money and they spend it and save it and invest it however they want to. Um, An income sharing community is one in which we have one or more community businesses and we all work for those businesses and we don't get a salary or anything but we do get food and a place to live and possibly a small stipend or maybe not. But the point is the community is who we work for and we don't have personal independent money from an outside job. And if we do have an outside job, we take our salary and give it to the community, and then in return we get food and lodging. This is such a huge difference in how community functions. Mm -hmm. Because in the independent income one, you're deciding many things together, but your finances are your own. Mm -hmm. And in the income sharing version, you're like in financial bed together. So, you know, are we going to pull the covers this way or that way? Do we have this many pillows or not making a metaphor or sleeping with a bunch of people? The point being, you're much more intimately connected when you're making financial decisions about your shared money if you're doing it that way. So it's a huge big thing to figure out when you're first starting. Do you want to be independent income or income sharing? Or a combination of both, which some communities do. Okay, so now we're doing our vision, mission, and aim, and we're creating our governance and our decision-making method, and we're keeping records of our agreements, and we have a decision log of all the decisions we've made, and we have a place where we can look at all the notes from all our meetings that we decided. We've got policies and agreements somewhere we can all find them. They're clear. They're in writing. We know where they are. They might be online. They might be physically available or both. And we have a conflict resolution method, and we have good communication and process skills. Okay. Now we make a list of criteria for our land that we want to get. Now we go start looking for our land based on this criteria. We get several different possibilities, and at a certain point, we create a legal entity or more, one or more, to co-own that land, and then we buy it. But sometimes it works out that we've got land first. Mm -hmm. And it's such a good deal because we have to snap it up right then because if we didn't, Mr. Fat Cat developer with a cigar is going to come along and buy that land and um, pave paradise and put up a parking lot, to quote a Canadian. And so, so um, maybe we should grab it now mm-hmm. and then do all those things. Yeah, so in I my, mean, there's in my so book, many. I, in my book, I say don't go buy the land first. Yeah. But I have <laughs> changed my mind since then because I've gotten too much experience seeing people who had to grab the land when they could. Mm-hmm. Now, if the community ID doesn't work out later, hopefully the person or persons who bought it can sell it to get their money back out or do something with it that's a different thing if they like. But I sure wouldn't want people to lose that land 
because some advice that I gave in my book before I knew better. Mm. So I have a new set of suggestions for people called the 19 Steps. Okay. And this is <laughs> something that I will also send you that you can put on the website connected to this video. Mm -hmm. um, so what it is, it's called, and I can send it to you in French too. I'll send you everything I have in English and French. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So um, the 19 Steps is how people typically found a successful new eco-village or intentional community. And it's, it's taking all the things most people do and cutting it into 19 little slices. But, you know, it could have been 25 slices or 17. It, I just sliced the pie the way I did, you know, membership process, decision-making and governance, the legal issues, the zoning. And, and so it's linear and sequential, but really it's not. Really some things happen at the same time. And they're really not all steps. Some are ongoing processes. But I call them steps because I didn't know what else to call them. You know? So I've got new and better information than when my book came out about sort of step by step what seems to work well. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd like to make that available to your viewers. Oh, that's yeah, fantastic. I'd love to read it personally. Definitely. Oh, you, <laughs> you will, you will. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that's where I had been looking to hop back to because when I was making that statement of what you've had come up since since the publishing of the book, I saw right. I saw some uh, light from your side. So glad to hear that you've already put it in a document that we can release to the public as well. Sure. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to go back quickly. So I think we could, we went back to where we where we were and we covered all the questions that we've asked so far. I'd want to ask kind of a two-part question. The first part is what role do you think technology plays in um, decision-making and how maybe, maybe it might hinder it, maybe it might help it. What are your thoughts on that? That's the first question. And the second question is I've, I've got, you know what, let's go with the first question first and then I'll explain to you what we've kind of brought up and kind of had as an idea that we've taken as a model from the internet and seen how it's worked and, and come, come together. And, um, how we're thinking about integrating it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So, okay. um, first, let's start with what you think. How do you think technology has helped or hindered communities and decision making? Okay, I'm going to take the word governance rather than just decision making. I'm going to sure. make the question a little bigger than great. just decision making. Yep. Okay. Um, there are. Um, I think I know what your actual question is going to be regarding making decisions online, I'm guessing. But before going there, I'm going to talk about technology in a more general way. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that people can use Google Hangouts or WebEx or any number of webinar software programs to teach things from one continent to another or across countries or long distance. And I'm hoping to get more and more. I'm going to need technical help and maybe I'll call you up and ask you for that to create, <laughs> to create a series of webinars where I can teach all kinds of things without spending jet fuel, which is not good for the environment or somebody's pocketbook, my host or mine, you know, uh, to go traveling here and there, much as I love to travel. Mm -hmm. And so um, I love the fact that Skype and online videos and YouTube and uh, TED Talks that we can all watch and webinars are all available to us, mm -hmm. particularly software that allows webinars where you can see each other and you can ask questions and show little pictures and so on. This, to me, is really, really delightful, and I want to get really involved in it. And I'm a kind of a, a techno-ignorant person, so I need, you know, young people who know stuff to help Beautiful. me out. So, we we you know, are here for you. That's something that oh, we've been great. Okay. already deeply in discussion about. Fabulous. I'm also really interested in videos. And I want to update my dream is to have little short segments between 5 and 9 and 13 minutes long on YouTube. Just one, two, three, four, five after the other where I'm doing my whole entire workshop on starting new communities. Awesome. Where I'm doing we... my whole entire workshop on sociocracy. The good side is it would be free. The second side is that there would be no opportunity to practice or to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So I have to be good at anticipating questions. I'm going to answer them in the video, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm already, I already know how to do that because I've taught so many workshops for so long. But the second thing is there's no practice exercises. On the other hand, people could get a really good sense of how to do something. So this is my great intention. And some new video friends are going to help me do 
some portion of this. But what I really want to do is use technology for education and to spread encouraging, empowering, accurate information. Or at least I hope accurate, you know, helpful. That's one thing. Making decisions we're going to help online. You just quickly, quickly stopping you there. When you come to yeah. Montreal, we're going to help you with that. That's for sure. Very cool. Yeah, <laughs> she's coming to Montreal. By the way, I don't think we mentioned it in this Not podcast yet. yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're you're actually coming to Montreal at the beginning of March, kind of potentially end of February, kind of thing. Anyway, there will be more information and dates, and you're going to see this on Valhalla, and I'm sure on your website and, and social networks and stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. It's coming. People are, you know, just so you know, anybody who's in the Montreal area, uh, you will be able to see this live um, with more information <laughs> coming soon. So anyway, sorry. Okay. Continue. Alrighty. Okay, I'll bet you want to talk about making decisions online with people who are not physically present in the same room. Yes, <laughs> definitely. But I have a I have a very specific way as to how I would go about it. We've we've kind of talked about it in a group as well, and a lot of people like this direction. We haven't put it into practice yet. Um, Why don't you it has been put it? into practice by other people though, and that's so I'll I'll go into that very quickly after. But okay. But do you want to hear it first, or do you, would you rather talk about it? I think I should hear your description so I can respond to it okay great okay <laughs> so I don't know how familiar you are with the internet or this this um, kind of site called reddit.com or if I'm you're familiar really... with how for example Iceland had the revolution and they came and rewrote their constitution I'm not wow okay great so put it this way they they created um, this kind of open source online decision-making tool Okay, and it's called, Iceland, I believe the Iceland, Iceland one is called You Decide, and Reddit is a system where people, it's user-generated content, so people put up a title or a topic that they want, and people, other users who are also you know, kind of registered on this can upvote or downvote this kind of content. So they can bring more to the attention and, and rise the ranks of attention on Reddit, and then or, or decrease the ranks of attention, and comment and do all sorts of stuff. What You Decide is, is taking that exact same kind of system, upvoting, downvoting, and, and priorities of, of topics to be seen by people kind of on the front page. Uh, they call it the front page of Reddit or the front page of this maybe decision-making app. And they actually added a voting system to like a yes, indifferent, no kind of method methodology to it, okay? Now, because you're not familiar with it, I'll kind of go a little bit deeper into it. We want to incorporate that exact same kind of decision-making process where we would have different, you know, in the same way that your community that you're living in has different committees, so do we. We would love, and then we have like kind of general, you know, topics and things that we would talk about. We would want to have this online platform on our site that everyone can see, so for, the, for a, a level of transparency, um, as well as learning that people can learn from how we're making decisions, what we're doing, what we're talking about. It's a great way of updating people. But beyond all that, it's a great, in our opinion, so far uh, in our kind of our conceptualization of it, it would be possibly the best way that people can participate in these decision-making processes, even if, for example, they, they leave the community for a period of time. Example, you're part of a community, you're coming to Montreal, you're coming for two weeks, but in that time frame, for, for example, perhaps you know, there's a decision to be made back at home. And the best way, it seems like the best way to be able to do something like that and interact in this decision-making process is to have this process be online, right? Instead of having to individually email everyone or everyone having to be physically present at any one meeting, they can at least have the, the notes and the, the, the pros and cons of these, of these decision points on the web. Now, I mentioned something there that I didn't mention earlier. In this decision-making process, when somebody brings up something to, to, to the attention, let's go with an example here. We have a piece of land. Um, one person wants to plant a tree in this one particular area of the land. The other person thinks that we're better off putting a solar panel there uh, because we need more energy. And they both have valid points. But now we're coming down to this decision point. This decision is amongst other decisions that need to be made. But let's say it now all of a sudden got ranked up towards the top because this is a growing and, and, and growing issue. How does this, this topic and how is this decision pr uh, promoted and how, how are each side of the argument and all the considerations uh, taken into account? Well, the way that this decision-making app has, has worked for Iceland and, and what we would want to do is that you are going to get the top pros and the top cons of the, any one decision. So let's go back to the example. Whether we should put, put a tree or a solar panel, what are the top pros of a tree? 
what are the top pros of a solar panel? What are the top pros or cons against the tree? And what are the top cons against the solar panel? And then allowing people to ingest all of this information in their own time. So it's if it's three in the morning or if it's, you know, uh, minutes before the vote or if it's like they're the people who are commenting and adding these pros and cons. OK, it allows everyone in this spectrum to make this decision and make it happen. That being said, OK, this seems on the surface sounds amazing, right? It sounds like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, it's, consen it's consensus based decision making or sociocracy to some degree in uh, on steroids and then using technology. But I think there's there's a degree of, of segregation that also comes from it. What happens if somebody's not necessarily as technologically savvy? I think part of the address of that is, well, you know, this program is fairly easy to use. Everyone can use it, but some people don't want to be in the computer. So instant challenge right there. Um, they want to be outside. They're more, they're more, you know, hands in dirt kind of thing type people. And there's other people who are more hands on keyboard kind of people. And, and they're both necessary in these communities and modern day communities in, in our opinion. And then there's the dirty hands on keyboard people. And there's but the dirty hands on keyboard people. Have, like dirt under the fingernails and they're typing. Exactly. And, and there's a hybrid, exactly. There's a hybrid between the two. Mm -hmm. I wonder how, based on my quick rendition of what it was, and obviously I haven't showed you a working model and, and you, yeah. you don't know the backstory of how Iceland did it. It did work though. It did, it did achieve very good results for them. So I, I guess it does speak some degree of, of um, tried and proven kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it in my initial explanation of it? What is your initial thoughts? What are some flags that come up sure. in your mind? Okay, this is easy. Uh, first of all, there are at least two different aspects of decision making, and this beautifully handles one but not the other. Okay. So it seems to me that this is a fabulous way to use technology and the design skill of software designers to create a message, to get a lot of data quickly, and to get a lot of help quickly without having to spend travel time and travel fuel. Mm -hmm. So this is basically good for the planet, it, you know, in terms of using up fossil fuel. And it's good for people in terms of not using up their time, because they can do it at 3 in the morning or minutes before the meeting, like you said, Mark. Um, and it's a way of learning what the most number of people most want really quickly mm -hmm. relative to the top pros, the top cons, and so on. Relative to that aspect of decision-making, it seems fabulous. And I think that sometimes there are decisions that are either not controversial or not complex, and this would be completely reasonable to do it this way. Mm -hmm. But there's another aspect of decision making that both consensus and sociocracy and holacracy all address that this does not address. And that is the co creative co intelligence of people in a room together figuring out what to do with, if it's in consensus, someone's concern or several people's different concerns so that we can revise the proposal, modify it to meet those concerns after our discussion generate the ferment of creativity to figure out how do we address these things while still address the issue that this proposal is designed to, you know, to resolve. Um, and sociocracy as well. In the consent decision-making method, we go around to each person to hear if they have uh, no objection to the proposal or an objection. And an objection doesn't mean a block like we're used to in consensus, not at all. It means I can see a way to make it better. Or it means, I can see there's something about it that's not quite right. Not sure what that is yet, but let's keep talking. Or it means, um, oops, we forgot to think about one factor here. Mm -hmm. Or it means, oops, um, there's one more thing we have to figure out before we can complete this proposal. So all objections in sociocracy are gifts to the circle regarding the proposal to help it get better. And so we go around and we hear from each person. And we're, uh, sociocracy has three really big values that it's based on, like the three foundational pillar things. One is equivalence of voice, one is transparency, and one is effectiveness. So we want to create a harmonious organization based on equivalence, transparency, and effectiveness. That sounds so good. And for that, we hear from each person. Because the most articulate don't get to run the show. 
And the shyest people don't get to evaporate. We're hearing from everyone, so we're really, really creating transparency and equivalence. Mm -hmm. But we can't, we're not wasting time on people endlessly discussing stuff because they just want to quote, be heard. They have to be on topic, on point. That's the effectiveness part. Now, sociocracy is designed by an engineer, actually. So it's so, sort of like how what you were just describing sounds like the way software engineers think. Um, engineers in general think, like, how can we create the most amount of benefit with the least amount of time and energy expended, and then how can we test it in real the real world to see if it really works well and then revise it to make it work better. Yeah, or... Well, that's not what I would call that. I would call that well, feedback loops. But anyway, yeah, getting I mean, back, it's like the concept of humanitarianism bringing in, brought into more of a technical or process type of decision making. But anyway, yeah. Well, what I'm talking about is the feedback loop of trying something, seeing how you might want to adjust it in real life once mm -hmm. you've tried it, and then adjusting it and trying that, and then seeing do you want to adjust it again? Because we're going back and forth between an idea and how it works in reality, and then modifying that an idea and how it works in reality. Well, that's that's how sociocracy works. So the point is, I don't see how this software would allow that kind of creative ferment that happens when one or more persons has an objection, like in sociocracy, or one or more people in a circle has a concern, like in, like in um, the consensus, and then the actual physical presence of us and our physical bodies and the vibes we're emanating, sitting in the room, seeing and feeling and vibing and hearing each other, together help us co-create some solutions. Because if we're doing this at different times in different locations online, we're not getting the vibes connection. We're not getting the see, hear, feel, body language, vocal tone. We're seeing little pixels that stand for words, and that's all we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And you probably know the statistics that say that only 3% of any communication is the actual word. Mm -hmm. And the other 97% is a combination of vibes, and body language and facial expression and vocal tone. And all that stuff really, really helps communicate. And I, we wouldn't have that mm -hmm. in the method that you have described. I fully agree. Unless, from time to time, we decided to alternate in-person meetings or webinar meetings yeah. where we're not exactly getting vibes in a physical way by you sitting there, but we're, we're getting you know, facial expressions and vocal tones and body language. And we're having that interspersed with our online polling system, which is what you might call what you just described. Let's say we could alternate between the two. And then every once in a while, we had an in-person meeting. It seems to me we'd have the best of all worlds mm -hmm. if we alternated these methods. I fully agree. I fully, fully, fully agree. I mean, there's so many things that you said there that I would like to address. The first is um, there is a way that kind of concerns can be heard and and I, I think can, can have their, their, their real way of shining, right? Like their real way of being, of being heard, okay? Well, I it's think... not just concerns being heard. It's been the co-creative co-intelligence process of together resolving them. Oh, that I fully agree with. That I fully <laughs> agree with is the, the number one limit, limitation of it. But at least the heard portion of it, like the whole, like said concern was brought up, said yeah. concern was, was seen at least yeah. that, and yeah. read of, okay? Yeah. Obviously people can selectively skip things and, mm -hmm. and people have selective hearing anyway. This happens in person or not in person. But right. the reality is that I, I, it, it can be heard in the sense that if most, if many people bring, somebody brings up a concern, how it becomes one of the top cons and one of the top, I guess, negative side of things is that Let's say, you know, oh, we really shouldn't put a solar panel there because the reality is it's a flood zone, example. Right. A lot of people could vote up that exact concern to the top. So it continues to rise. It continues to have more and more eyes upon it. I it's think, got more weight. Yeah. So it has more weight and more and more more consideration by all parties. And more right. people from the positive side might start shifting over to the negative side. There has yeah. to be a delay and, and there has to be a process and a delay in when a topic was brought to, to, to action, how, how long it stays there for discussion and how long it stays there for collaborative um, problem solving and collaborative um, decision making and yeah. before it is really voted upon. I do think, and I completely agree with you on the hybrid side of things, that there's something that comes out of doing things online 
that allows people to be more cynical. They can be very direct and sometimes very, uh, very angry and nitpicky with people. They can get very hung up on words in the same way that maybe you know a particular somebody uses a, a, has a more limited vocabulary uses a word that that angers people and mm -hmm. and they shouldn't maybe maybe had had they been in person they would have realized hey this person didn't really mean it in that way shape or form and that there was more of a positive vibe it completely eliminates that that whole nonverbal communication outside of things sure. and I think yeah. that that is absolutely huge you know uh, yeah you can't you can't ignore that so I do think that. I fully agree with what you're saying, and I'm, I'm glad again to, to hear it, is that maybe the best way is that there is a hybrid version of it. Maybe the best way is that for small decisions where there's lots of cohesion and there's lots of consensus that comes out of it right away, like, oh, yeah, I think we should plant the tree here, and there's an overwhelming positive yes kind of vote to it mm -hmm. or an overwhelming positive no kind of vote to it, that the, that's this is the perfect kind of system that this can allow – for meetings to be quicker, for, for, for decisions to be made in a maybe a more efficient and, and, and effective way. Sometimes disseminating this information online is, is a very huge time saver for small decisions that don't need to take up everyone's time and that maybe uh -huh. not everyone is involved with, you know? Uh -huh. um, but I agree that there, we, we do have to always keep some in, a community is a community because you guys, people get together it's mm -hmm. not always just an it's not just an online community if you you know if what you're if this if your intentional community is a purely online thing so be it but if you're planning on living with one another i think you got to talk to your neighbors you got to talk to your your peers and people in person uh fairly regularly too you know well it seems that what we're both saying here is that we feel an appreciation to the freedom and flexibility that online tools provide the group that wants to do some organizing together. Mm -hmm. And the nature of community itself is a sort of in-person vibe connection, trust connection thing, and thus we need some in-person meetings. Mm -hmm. And a halfway, maybe it's not really half halfway, but you know, an in, in between kind of thing is uh, webinars mm -hmm. where, we, where we meet. Sometimes I do consultations for communities, and they're seeing my face on a great big screen on a computer, and I'm seeing them sitting around a table, and somebody's angling the computer so that I can see them all, you know. And then somebody over here talks, and somebody angles the computer so I can see them. And they, basically, it's computer cameras looking at each other. But I can see them and feel them, and not feel them, but I can hear them, and they can hear me. Okay, this is cheaper than me flying to some other city. You know, mm -hmm. it's a way to do it. It's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. So so there's ways to use online methods for polling people through an Internet method, mm -hmm. talking to each other with cameras and hearing, and then plain old in person, which you might call the old-fashioned method. Mm -hmm. Actual physical bodies. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, we're going to have to slowly bring this podcast to a close. I wanted to invite Nick. Do you have any questions? Or I, I do a lot of talking on some of these things, but anything you want to talk about, any questions you wanted to, to kind of go into before, because we do have something else after um, that you wanted to address or, or bring up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, what I'd most like to do is just offer the floor to you to say something that you have either been running into recently or something that's just kind of like one of your you know go-to kernels of this is what i really <laughs> want everyone to hear i do have one of those thanks so much for asking me Nick. so i want to talk about my favorite new thing which is what i call the three aspects of a healthy thriving successful community so i like to draw this circle and I'm drawing it on my notebook here, and it's not looking very much like a circle. It looks a little like a lopsided egg, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. And so there's three hugely important things. So now I've made three chunks of this circle. Mm -hmm. Is that showing up okay? Uh, on our side, I mean, I don't know how it's going to show up on the recorded I version think, of it. Um, on that. our side, it's I a little bit choppier. At one point, the internet quality went down a little bit, it seems. Um, but I, I think... Is it, are they all okay. overlapping and meeting in the middle? Put it that way. Well, let me just try this again. I've got, I grabbed up some red color. Is that visible? Oh, no. okay, yeah, it is visible. Okay, the way it is, I see it is okay. as a circle, 
and then there's right. a, a mini there's a circle in between it's and like then a, there's divisions but within the two circles yeah, it's like a donut right. broken into three sections Ex exactly perfect. yes a okay donut great broken into three sections so i think there are these three really important things but they all come from one middle thing so i'm going to say that one of the things i'm not going to say what it is yet and the second one i would call community glue community glue and by community glue, that's the second one there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all those things that people do together in order to have um, fun times together, shared, enjoyable activities. These can be shared meals, preparing meals, work parties, um, storytelling evenings, poetry evenings, skit night, movie night, playing games, playing card games, playing board games, playing Scrabble, playing Chinese checkers, playing physical things like volleyball and, and soccer and football and uh, um, frisbee and all physical sports kinds of things, singing together, dancing together, singing and dancing together, drumming, chanting, singing, jamming with music. All these things are things that groups of people generally enjoy doing. What this does is creates oxytocin, which is a hormone that gets secreted by a person who's feeling shared, enjoyable activities. The oxytocin makes that person, believe it or not, feel gratitude and trust and connection with the other people. Feeling that gratitude and trust and connection creates more oxytocin. Oxytocin, I'll spell it. It's the name of a O-X-Y-T-O-C-I-N. and I've written it right there. Mm -hmm. It's a hormone, and it comes right out of our bloodstream and goes into us, and then we feel that way. Mm -hmm. It's the more oxytocin we create, by the more shared, enjoyable activities we create, the more we create, create a feeling, a visceral feeling that we actually feel, of trust and connection yeah. and gratitude to these other people. So we need to do this a lot in our community in order to help create that general basic vibe and so on. Somebody's about to walk in the door behind you. Oh, I think it's a dog. <laughs> it's not a dog. <laughs> a cat? It's a one person? of our members. <laughs> crawling, crawling on in. the ground. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> this is my room. <laughs> this is hilarious. Bye. Okay. So I'll go to the next one. The next one is what I would call good <laughs> process and communication skills. What was so the first word? Communication skills and what? Good process okay. and communication skills. So I'm doing C O M M just to save a little room. That's the second big, huge, important thing I think is needed in any community. And what I mean by that is we talk to each other in better, more skilled, more kindly, courteous ways than we do outside of community. In our family, in our housemates, in our job, in the nonprofit we volunteer for, in our book club, in our men's group, our women's group, we just might talk any old way with any old result. But when we're doing intentional community, we have to be better than that. Mm -hmm. We have to do and say things that do not result in potential harm or potential misunderstanding or potential upset. Mm -hmm. Therefore, one of the things we could learn is nonviolent communication, which I'm assuming your viewers know what it is, and I'm assuming you know what that is, right? Uh, do you? I, yeah, I think we both do. Uh, some of our okay. viewers might, and some of them won't, but I mean, you, you don't have to go into it necessarily. They, they should Google it. They have the Wikipedia or, or whatever. Sure, sure. And also, you can put a link. <laughs> If you want to. Okay, so that's what I recommend. And I recommend restorative circles, which is a conflict resolution method based on NBC, so that the group has loads and loads of good ability to talk to each other in ways that actually creates harmony and trust and connection. Well, these good ways of, of talking actually produces oxytocin. It actually produces the very same thing we're trying to do with community glue, mm -hmm. which is to prevent a sense of trust, connection, and harmony and goodwill. And we're doing that if we're doing good communication skills. We have a whole lot of conflict. We need more of this. We need to speak to each other more carefully. We need to have more conflict resolution more often. But if we have a lot of community glue, we feel so good to start with, we might not have to do this so much. Mm -hmm. These two things have a mutually reinforcing, mutually... Um, feedback affects Absolutely. each other. So what's the first one? Because this one is the third one. I always leave the first one off until last because people don't guess it. Okay, and that is what I call effective project management. <laughs> 
Awesome. Which means, you know, how do we actually run this place? How do we determine what we do with our money? How do we collect it, spend it, save it, keep it, track it? And who tracks the trackers? <laughs> our time. Our time. How do we spend our time? How do we spend it, allocate it, and track it? And who tracks the trackers? And our information, where is it available? How can we all find it anytime, night or day? Is it online? Is it clear? Is it accurate? Is it available? Is it one or two mouse clicks away and not obscure? So how do we handle time, money, energy, information? Mm -hmm. This is not decision-making. This is just how we manage. Let, let me say, okay, do, do businesses need management? Sure. Do nonprofits? Sure. Do intentional communities? Oh, no, we're communities. We don't need that. <laughs> Absolutely. Baloney, yeah. we totally need it. We totally yeah. need it. And a whole lot of kind of visionary idealistic people who might want to have a whole much better life on the planet, you know, <laughs> know about solar panels, know about nonviolent communication, but do they know about management? No, I don't want to know about management. That's what corporations use. Corporations are bad. No, I don't want it. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. We need it. We need it. So fully, what's in the middle here? I use my little red one here. In the middle is what I call governance. I have to make this easier to read. Governance. It's the very way we do this one. Governance, the heart of any community, in my opinion, is how we do our project management. If we have no governance system, we can barely do this. Mm -hmm. If we can barely do this, we have a whole lot of conflict. Then we need a whole lot more careful communication and more frequent conflict resolution. If we don't have much community glue, the conflict is worse. If we have a lot of community glue, we're going to do better over here, but we're going to lose community glue if the project isn't being managed well because we don't have good governance. Mm -hmm. a, piece, a piece of governance, not the whole thing, but just a piece, is our decision-making method. Mm -hmm. But decision-making is not governance. Decision-making is the how. How do we make them? What do we make them about is the governance. So governance has within it decision-making, but it's not the whole story, right? It's just mm -hmm. the piece. So what I want for communities is a fabulously effective governance method, allowing us to pay our bills on time, know where our money is, keep good track of our money, have a good strategic plan, money in, money out, when do we need more? Labor in, labor out, when do we need more? Who's doing labor, who's not doing labor, who needs to do more labor? What are our decisions? Where are they? How can we find them? I see you grinning, Mark. I think it's because you know a thing or two about management. You've studied it. Thank yeah, God yeah, you no, have. I, Thank yeah. God you have. I want you to get back up in your community that communities need government. Because it has everything to do. When a community is thriving and running along smoothly like... There's not problem. That alone creates community blue. Mm -hmm. sure. When a community is running sm smoothly, we don't need to speak so damn carefully to each other all the time and use perfectly politically correct NBC language. We can just plain old talk. We don't have to have so much conflict resolution in these sort of circles. When we aren't paying our bills, we suddenly find out we owe property taxes. We suddenly find out our legal issues are actually horrible because our basic legal entities aren't legal. And one community I know did find out. When we find out that we um, cannot find the agreements that we made because we're not keeping track of them, when we create a, a decision that we have to review later but we forget to and then everybody's upset, that's because we're screwing up on effective project <laughs> management. We need a good governance system so that we can do it. Governance has everything to do with these three aspects, the healthy, thriving, successful community. And that's my wrap. I... Beautiful, and that's a wrap. <laughs> can't can't say much about that. I know you just made Mark a very happy person, and I think uh, what what you really outlined there is 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 something that we we have a we have some people here that that really understand that. I myself was a business management student. Mark oh, is obviously really? very much in the management side of things. We have a few other people here who really get that, and I think that's what's held the Valhalla project. Uh, despite all of these different paths that we were following, you know, it's very ambitious to start a community, but to start a community and want to document the entire process and want to figure out how to connect people to seeing that documentation and, and, yeah. and. 
yeah. it's you know you need you need that ability to look at the whole picture and and see how how it can be governed and how it can be managed absolutely I, you pointed out my grin and my grin is there because I could not agree anymore. I honestly right. couldn't have said it better myself that that whatever I don't know what you term it that wheel or donut with the what is you know the cut three, three aspects of healthy thriving communities is what sure I call great it. so that's that's that I mean I, I hope that we can link more information on that I, I know I'm sure that we're going to talk more about this when you come and visit Montreal but I think we have to have another podcast where we talk about just that okay. where where we talk about like how big of a role that you know like you talked about decision making people seem to think that decision making is governance they're not one it and the same isn't. They're I fully different. get that. Yeah. Not everyone yeah. does. Uh, I, right. I think process, planning, all these things are, are, are huge topics, which I'm sure are included in the 19, 19 point list that you've got. But I would love to talk more about that because I think we're on the right path here at Valhalla. I, again, I, I always bring it back to, to what we're doing because this is what I know. Um, right. We're on the right path. I think other communities have definitely got this down. Um, and but there's so much that people need to learn about planning and, and process. I think we, we nailed out a big one that's starting with why and, and understanding how the how and all those things come out. Um, mission statement is huge. We talked about today, uh, talked about technology in a little bit and sociocracy and, and the, the, how you're, you've shifted from consensus to uh, sociocracy uh, and for the most part. So, I mean, look, I, it seems like we need another podcast to go into this even deeper. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely be in touch soon for your visit to Montreal, uh, for another podcast. Um, and for all the more information on all of this, some more details, obviously, we can only cover so much in, in an hour and a half or whatever it is. Um, but ideally, all of this, we're going to link in the description below. Uh, hopefully, you know, a lot more of this information is on your new website as well, hopefully. Um, I mean, thank you so much for, for putting the grin on my face today. Uh, and for sharing all of this knowledge with the, all our listeners, because I, I know that this is valuable information to them as as much as it was to us. Thank you. All right, uh, so we'll it's, been talk. A, it's been a pleasure. And we'll talk again. Oh, without a doubt. Have a great one, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye.